Fantastic. So there's a lot of moving pieces here. So I've never used this software before. So hopefully I can keep track of the chat and also figure out what's going on. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, spatial analysis of, of high parameter uh, imaging data. I kind of hope that anyone that's uh, that's here listening to this was also listening to Nils this morning. And so he gave a pretty good background of the, the type of data we're going to be talking about. Um, but I got a little bit of presentation envy this morning. And so I saw Nils live coding. And so I've decided to pivot and try to do some live coding myself. And so if this all falls apart, it falls apart, but I'm pretty sure I can pivot uh, back to what I was originally planning on doing if things don't turn out that well. And so hopefully everyone's seen images like this. So we've got these fantastic technologies that have come out that really allow us to to look at tissues and, and see cells in their native tissue environment uh, at quite high detail. And, and the really kind of awesome thing that's happened in the last few years is that we've been able to have all these technologies which can measure uh, up to 40, 40 different uh, uh, antigens uh, uh, in this tissue space. And so here we've got a, a piece of head and neck uh, tumor um, and we're just visualizing uh, six six uh, colors and you can already see the, the, the amount of variety and the, the different resolution of cell types. And so to me, this is a really, really exciting thing, but with really, really exciting things, there also becomes really, really uh, challenging problems. And so uh, uh, our university, we've recently purchased, or at least a few years ago, uh, an I, a Hyperion imager. So we generate IMC data and more recently a uh, codex. Uh, imager and so we've been trying to think of different ways to handle this analytically to get the uh, data out for all our collaborators and so I just mentioned uh, codex and IMC but there's obviously a lot of uh, there's a large variety of these technologies that can generate uh, similar types of data where we get these uh, high parameter measurements for lots and lots and lots of different cells at either the protein or the RNA level um, my experience has all been at the protein level, whether it's been with SciSIF data, IMC or Codex. Uh, there's obviously a lot of other technologies um, and uh, this is in no way uh, an exhaustive list either. And so uh, everything I talked to, talk today is, is hopefully aimed at uh, a pipeline to, to analyze uh, information from these uh, technologies. And so I hopefully I'm not going to be too ambitious but I'm hoping to, to walk you through a demonstration of how we can use a, a bunch of different R packages that we've developed to, to get our handle on this type of, of data. And so, like Matt said, if at any point uh, things get confusing, uh, please interrupt me, whether it's on the chat or whether you're just shouting out and I'll try to clarify some things. Uh, and if you're feeling very, very motivated, um, you can find uh, the code that I'm going to use for this workflow um, on our GitHub page, the Sydney BioX GitHub page. So you're welcome to check that out if you want to. Um, so because this is a package demonstration, I thought I'd use some some data that's out there and publicly available. And so uh, we've, we, I've decided to use uh, this Mibitoff data set uh, from Michelangelo. And they're effectively just looking at invasive breast cancer. And you can see that they, they've managed to generate these really, really beautiful images where you can see a lot of structure in the tissue. And it's this kind of structure that we're hoping to quantify and encapsulate and hopefully use, use to learn something about information. So another great thing about this data set and why I chose it is because it roughly follows uh, the workflow that I'm hopefully trying to, to outline. And so what they've got is they've got uh, a bunch of images on uh, people with these uh, these breast cancers that either progress or do not progress. Uh, they go and do a lot of different uh, uh, analysis. So they, they look at cell types and cell states and look for differences in these. Uh, they look at uh, tissue compartment in rich, rich men and look at cell to cell proximities. They're looking for these spatial relationships. I do some uh, uh, tissue microenvironment morphometrics, which is something that I don't and can't do at the moment. Uh, but then they go and use all this information. Eventually, they use it to, to classify patients. And so hopefully in half an hour's time, uh, I'll have given you all the information that you need that you can go off and, off and do this, this style of analysis in maybe like 20 lines of code. So I think that's really, really exciting and really, really cool. And so like I said, I think I'm going to try pivoting 
there's some live coding. And so if it falls apart, it falls apart. Um, but that's what it is. Uh, so again, please interrupt me if you've got any questions. We can hopefully look at things as we go along. I'm going to start by reading in our data. And so again, the reason I chose this data was because I thought it was pretty, pretty cool and nifty, but it's also quite small, at least of the version that I'm using. And so we're going to look in here. And so this data is sorted by um, they've, what they've done is they've gone and put uh, a new folder for every single uh, patient. And so we can look at a particular patient ID here. We can see that they've also split their images up into images for each uh, individual channel. And so, like I said, this is small data. You look at it, this is nice and compressed. We're talking about like 10 kilobytes uh, per, per channel. And so you're looking at around five megabytes per image. And so I've got all this up on GitHub, um, which is means you don't have to go anywhere and download stuff. These are all small files. Everything's nice. But this is the way that our data is um, organized. And so to read our data in, um, we can go and use uh, the EB image package from Wolfgang Huber. And this is fantastic. And it'll just go and read the data in in this kind of folder file format um, into uh, an image um, object. And like I said, I hope that a lot of you attended uh, Nils's talk this morning, uh, because what we're going to do is now that we've read in all our images, I'm actually going to go reread those in uh, into a CIDO image list. Uh, and so I do this for a couple of reasons. One, it's just a, a nice object that we can put some metadata on. Uh, but two, it, it allows us to uh, store these images again uh, back on disk as H5 files so we don't have to have them loaded into memory. And so this is generally quite a convenient uh, thing to do. And as you can see, um, we're really not using much space in memory now that we've read these, these on. Um, as with any data, we're kind of eventually going to be interested in looking at associations with um, some sort of clinical phenotype. And so it's a little bit ugly, but I'm going to read in uh, some clinical uh, data with a little bit of manipulation to make sure that our image IDs match between the clinical data set and what we've got. And then I can go and take all of this clinical data and put it into the mcols of our images. And so we can look at that. This is what we've got. And so for each image, we've got its image ID, some information about the patient, in particular its status of whether it's a non-progressor or not, and then a bunch of other things that we're not going to be using today. Okay, and so the first step of our pipeline, so we've gone and read in our data, it's all loaded up into R. Um, we've got a bunch of images. One of the first things we might wanna be doing if we're gonna go and wanna make conclusions about cells is figure out where those cells are. And so we've developed a, a, a simple package called SimpleSeg, which goes and performs really simple uh, segmentation on these images. And so we developed this for a, a few reasons. Uh, one, we really liked uh, the segmentation workflows outlined in EB image, uh, but we just wanted to make these even easier for all our students who are going off and doing this analysis to try to take out uh, as, as, as many unnecessary um, complications as we possibly could. And so there's lots and lots of different options to our simple seg uh, package, uh, but what we're doing here is we're taking our images, we're going to go use a combination of principal component analysis in the histone H3 channel uh, to identify our nuclei. And we're then going to uh, square root transform these um, and uh, threshold them. And then once we've found our nuclei, uh, we're going to do some sort of size selection. But then we're also going to, to get our cell bodies. We're simply just going to di dilate out um, our nuclei by uh, two, two pixels to try to, to, to capture the the marker expression that's outside of the nuclei and so while that's running it shouldn't take too long i'd probably jump back and tell you why we like um, our simple seg and why we think it's nice so there's obviously lots of really cool um, software out there for doing uh, segmentation so we mostly use elastic when we're trying to do uh, things that are complicated uh, but all of these require you to, to be outside of the R environment. All rights use fancy wrappers that are calling Python from inside of R, and they're kind of complicated 
to install. And so, like I said, we were originally off doing a lot of our segmentation uh, using EB image, but again, to make things really easy for our students, uh, uh, Alexander Nichols, one of my honors students, has gone off and, and written this simple said package. And so, uh, one of the really cool things about it is that it does automatically choose a, a, some of the few key tuning parameters that uh, we were having trouble with. And it does a, a lot of other cool things and gives a few different options for the types of segmentation that you might want to do. Um, like I said, this is a simple segmentation. All we're doing is identifying uh, nuclei, and we've got a few different ways of. Um, estimating um, our cell bodies. But here, if uh, in this diabetes data set, uh, we look at, we quantify uh, a synaptophysin expression uh, in our nuclei and compare them to the original elastic uh, um, quantifications, we can see that we get a, a reasonable correlation between uh, our new uh, quantifications and the uh, original ones. So that's just looking inside the nuclei. If we just dilate out from the nuclei and just purely look in that disc that we're uh, around the nuclei, we can see we also get a reasonable correlation um, in intensities between the, the, two, the two approaches. And then if we go and combine the information from our dilated discs with the nuclei, we get a much stronger correlation. And so by using a really simple segmentation approach, we effectively end up getting the, the, the very similar quantifications as going through and using elastic, which requires you to go and train um, where cells are and, and it requires a, a little bit of manual kind of curation. So again, for a first pass analysis, uh, we've been using this simple seg package. Uh, and here again, we've just got some densities <coughs> that shows that if you just use um, the disk, you get reasonable correlation between our, our disk uh, quantifications and elastic. If you use the nuclei, the, the correlations become even stronger. And then if you use both the disk and the nuclei, you get quite strong and, and concordance between a really simple segmentation and the cool stuff that you can do with elastic. And so we'll jump back. Hopefully it's finished running by now. Cool. And so our segmentation's finished. We've just gone and segmented uh, the cells in around 70 different images. We can go and look at the quality of these segmentations. And so again, EV image uh, has got um, a lot of nice functionality for looking at segmentation. And so this display function is pretty cool because you can generate plots in your viewer, which means you can go through and zoom into different regions to kind of check out what things are, are doing. We can see that in general, uh, things seem to be segmented Okay, not perfectly, but okay. Uh, Cytomapper also has some really nice functionality for uh, checking out segmentations. And so hopefully you saw this this morning uh, with Nils. Um, here is, we can have the capacity to go through and set a bunch of different colors for different channels. We can scale these in some way uh, using uh, the BCG thing. And we can see again that the segmentation, I think, looks pretty nice and pretty reasonable. So again, for first pass analysis, we think this seg, uh, simple seg package makes uh, reading images in and segmenting images uh, quite easy. So now that we've segmented our cells, um, something that we're probably really, really interested in is quantifying uh, the amount of marker expression in each cell. And so again, in the, the cytomapper package, we can use the measure objects uh, function. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna take our masks uh, uh, in our in images and then calculate the uh, average abundance of each marker for each cell, as well as a few simple um, morphology characteristics. <clears throat> and so this isn't necessarily quick. And the reason why it's not super, super quick is because it's going and reading um, each of the images from those uh, H5 files. Um, and so it does take a little bit of time. And so uh, how this, this function works is that uh, what it takes all of these features and it uh, loads everything into a single cell experiment. And so it, it puts all of your um, measurements into an assay uh, called counts, but then in the cold data of this thing, it also stores 
uh, information about like the area and the mean, but most importantly, your X and your Y coordinates. And so we're going to be using these quite a lot as we go through and um, continue our analysis. And so we can go and look uh, at the abundance of uh, any markers. And so here we're looking at pan keratin. Zoomed in a lot. You can see that th this marker is really highly skewed. And so each of these is a density um, of, of, of the marker in all 70 cells, highly skewed. It's really probably quite difficult to see um, which cells would either have ex pan keratin expressed or not. Um, so what we can do is we can go through and use our little normalized cell function where we're going to do a square root transform. Um, and then we're also going to trim the 99th quantile of each marker and scale it, do a min-max scaling between uh, 0 and 1. And so if we plot these again, <coughs> we can see that while not perfect, we've now got this really bimodal distribution. Um, and uh, at least it's now clear that there are cells that express pan keratins and cells that are not. If, again, we wanted to progress with this further, we would go and use our SC merge uh, package uh, for really harmonizing marker expressions between images. But uh, this kind of bimodal um, pattern is probably enough to effectively go through and do some clustering and identify our cell types. So that's what we're going to go do. And so um, one of my students, uh, Elijah Willey, has developed um, a FUSOM package. And so effectively, this is just a self-organizing map um, that we've designed specifically for um, this spatial type of data. And so I'll go and run that now. It's quite quick. <coughs> Sorry, I had COVID last week, and so I'm suffering. Um, and what this goes and does is it takes a single cell experiment um, and potentially a set of markers if you want to restrict the markers used for clustering. Um, it goes and builds a self-organizing map and then uh, clusters that self-organizing map into a specific number of clusters. And so here I've clustered into 20 clusters and we can go and use a function from scatter uh, to try to interpret what those clusters are. I hope I can zoom out just a little bit. Oh, did I lose that? And so here we've got each cluster and we can see this clustering's worked quite nicely. So when in doubt, I always go and look for T cells. And we can see that we've got a, a cluster with our CD8 positive T cells and a cluster with, <coughs> sorry, with our CD4 positive. I'm going to drink, sorry. <coughs> our CD4 positive T cells, CD8 positive T cells. You look closely, you can see your B cells. Oh, the wonders of presenting at home, straight to the sink. Uh, macrophages, so things look kind of quite nice. So quite happy with that. Um, I just arbitrarily chose 20 clusters, but we can um, go out and use the estimate the number of clusters to go through and uh, generate a bunch of different uh, statistics or quantifications we could use to potentially optimize these. We can see if we use the gap method um, that we probably would have chosen around 22 uh, clusters. So 20 isn't a horrible thing. And like I said, you get the majority of the immune population, so things are kind of nice. Um, one thing we might want to do if we want, now that we've got these clusters, we might want to go see if the abundance of any of these clusters or cell types are associated uh, with progression in some way. And so you can go off and use edge R or diff site to do this. Um, but we've got a really simple convenience function just for doing um, uh, T tests and Wilcox and rank some tests on these columns. And I think the most important thing we can see here is that um, we really don't see any clusters that are associated with progression, at, at least just what, at the kind of proportion level. Nothing's really changing in, in abundance relative to progression, which is unfortunate, but that's what we see. And so this was the, the most strongly associated cluster, and we can see that it's, for whatever reason, more expressed, more abundant in progressors versus non-progressors. Okay, we could go do some dimension reduction and check things out, but let's give that a skip. 
So now that we've done, uh, we've segmented our images, identified our clusters, we've just looked to see if the abundance of clusters are changing, we might want to progress a little bit further and start making use of our spatial information. Um, and so uh, here we've developed the spicy R package, uh, my, one of my students, Nicholas Kinyet, um, and um, yeah, it's quite easy to run, let's start it running. So what it does is it goes and looks at pairwise associations between each of the cell types uh, and looks to see if uh, these associations are changing relative to some condition. <coughs> and so we've got our cell types stored in the clusters column in our single cell experiment. And we've also got our status condition and we don't need much information. We just need the X, Y coordinates. We need the radii that we want to quantify our spatial associations over. And here I'm also using this sigma equals 50, which just accounts for a little bit of the, the global structure in the images. We can see in this image over here that there is this global spatial structure. We may or may not want this to, to influence our um, quantifications of association. So I'm just dialing it back a little bit. Uh, and again, we can see if we go and look. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. We've got the pairwise association between two clusters and that after accounting for multiple hypothesis testing, uh, there's really not anything strongly associated with uh, their progression status. Um, and we can visualize this quite easily and quite nicely using the SIGNIF plot. And so on the Y axis here, we've got clusters on the X axis here, we've got clusters. Uh, and each of these uh, pairwise associations is colored by red or blue, depending on whether the cell types seem to be attracted to each other or avoiding each other. And circled at the moment are all the clusters with just a nominal p-value uh, less than 0 0.05. Um, and if you are really, really quick, you can see that one of the only global patterns that we seem to be seeing is that uh, between the, the non-progressors and the progressors, uh, overall, everything seems to be uh, their associations seem to be moving to a more avoiding kind of thing. So here they're, they're kind of strongly attracted in one group and that attraction becomes weaker. Here they're weakly avoiding in one group and they become even more strongly avoiding in the other. So there seems to be some sort of dispersive uh, thing happening uh, as people become more progressive. I don't know what that means. Okay, so we've gone and checked for changes in proportion, changes in uh, cellular relationships. We can also go through and look to see if we can, can find these cellular neighborhoods uh, in our images. And so these cellular neighborhoods are effectively a fancy way of looking for spatial associations between multiple different cell types. So we've gone from like a pairwise situation to kind of like this multivariate kind of thing. And so we're going to run our Lisa class function. And so it just goes and clusters uh, these, these spatial association statistics. <coughs> Um, into lots and lots of different regions. Um, and we can, again, go and try to interpret what these, these regions are that we identify. And so here we've just said, go and identify five different regions, and then we can see uh, which regions, which clusters are appearing more frequently in each of these regions. And so you can see some of these regions are capturing um, potentially interactions between multiple uh, cell types. Uh, and we can obviously go and visualize these. And so here we look at one image, and we can see that we end up with these fancy kind of patterns uh, of association. And so we've got some cells here that all seem to have some sort of particular <laughs> spatial arrangement and things are what they are. Now, obviously looking at this plot, we can see which cells we've assigned to which region, but we can't necessarily relate that back to which cell types are which. And so I've written this simple hatching uh, plotting function that's quite slow, but it does kind of end up generating slightly informative uh, images. And so here we've got this hatching plot where uh, each of the regions is uh, represented by a hatching pattern. And then we've uh, colored each of the, the, the cells by the cluster that we're assigned to. And we can see that we're finding um, regions that may represent something. In particular, we've kind of got a region that represents our tumor and immune border. We've got regions that are very much the tumor and then a bunch of other things that uh, I, I, we probably don't need to go through and interpret. And so because we've assigned cells 
to regions, we can obviously go through and look to see if the proportion of cells in each of these regions is changing from image to image and associate with that. <coughs> <coughs> status <coughs> and most likely because we're doing fewer tests in this case we do end up identifying a region uh, that is uh, significantly associated with progression status is what it is again we could go back and try to interpret which cells are most frequent in these regions and hopefully knowing which cells are which cell types Okay, we've also got this, this really nice package called SC Features, which is designed for both single cell sequencing data and this, this spatial uh, data. And it goes through and can calculate a bunch of different quantifications of features on these images. And so I might just flick back to my original slides. Oh, I should go back and show you this. Sorry to bounce around. The reason why we like using FuseSum uh, is because it really does perform better than a, a lot of different other uh, clustering approaches. So we've looked at FlowSOM and Phenograph. And when people are applying these clustering approaches, quite often they overcluster their data and then manually go through and start merging clusters that seem to make sense to identify cell types. And so if we go and apply FuseSOM to data and FlowSOM to data, even though FlowSOM would have been used to originally generate the package, uh, the clusters, someone's gone and done man manual curation, and we end up finding that FuseSOM is is much more associated with these manually curated clusters than what FlowSOM would be if we choose a similar number of clusters. So we get these adjusted RAND index and these mutual informations uh, that perform quite well. All right, sorry, bouncing around. Okay, so our SC features. So we, we know that data can be quite complex. So here is a little a cube that would represent some single cell data, wherefore we've got information on cells, we've got uh, abundance measures of genes or proteins of these cells, and then each of these cells might be coming from a different person. So to do any sort of machine learning or testing, we really want to take this kind of complex data structure and flatten it out into something that's just samples by features. And so this, this function is pretty cool. We've gone through and uh, developed a bunch of different ways for, for doing this. We can either simply calculate cell type proportions with some different transformations. Uh, in our case, what we're going to end up using is cell type specific gene expression measurements. So the expression measurements of each gene within each particular cell type. We can obviously also go look at some spatial um, statistics too. Oh no, didn't want to do that. Okay, flip back. Oh, the whole time I haven't had it running. Oh, shouldn't take too long. So this will just go through and we've just asked it to simply calculate proportions, even though we've already got those. Uh, and then also calculate the average expression <coughs> of each marker uh, in each cell type. I'm not coughing. This is absolutely brilliant. Aren't you glad that I'm not there coughing all over you? The wonders of virtual. Okay, and so now that we've got all these measures, we can go simply test to see if there are any genes changing with any particular cell type that are associated with progression. And again, we find things with small p-values, but none of them really hold up once you account for the fact that we're doing, I don't know, 20 times 40 tests. Okay, so we've gotten to the stage where we've gone and looked at some different features within different cells. We've looked at spatial interactions. We've identified cellular regions. Now we can try to pull it all together and perform some classification. And so we've developed the Classify R package, uh, Darius Strebenak, um, to not just perform classification, but as a framework for evaluating how that classification is performing. And so hopefully most people that fit classification models will try to evaluate, uh, validate them <coughs> are used to using cross-validation. And so we just developed a bunch of convenience functions that go and, and perform cross-validation on um, a lot of different uh, objects that we're used to using. So this will take a, a, a multi-assay experiment, uh, a, a the capital data frame, I, I don't know how people kind of respond to this, um, a, a list of 
data frames, uh, anything, and then we can go and just perform uh, a, a, a range of kind of, in, uh, we've implemented a few different classification approaches. So we've got like random forest, SVM. In this case, we're using an elastic net model. And then I've asked it to go perform five-fold cross-validation uh, with 100 repeats. And so if we do this, we'll hopefully get some um, classification results. Last one. So what I've fed it here is I've gone and I've got my proportions and my um, means for each cell type. I've also handed it my uh, region information and then stored this in a list of data frames, passed this through to classify R. And so now I'm simply looking at a box plot of the AUCs from models built on each of these data types. And we can hopefully see that um, if we use the, the average expression of each marker in each cell type or the proportions of uh, cells in each image, neither really do, do a fantastic job of uh, classifying our patients into progression status. And this is, this is uh, actually reflective of what they found in the original paper. But if we go and use some more complex spatial information, so the proportion of our different regions, we end up getting AUCs of around 0.7. And so in the paper, they use the morphometric um, measurements and they ended up getting up to around 0.75, but I think this is pretty neat and pretty nice. And so I can't believe I didn't stumble too much with the live coding. Um, but effectively what I've presented here uh, or tried to is a, a kind of cohesive pipeline that makes it easy to perform um, a, a standard type of spatial analysis that people might want to do. And so, like I said, this is something that a lot of our students in the labs have started using and they've been finding it reasonably easy and cohesive. Uh, and so I'd like, like to acknowledge the Sydney Precision Data Science Centre. We're a group of, of academics that are all into anything kind of statistical and, and biomedical. Um, and so they're always worth acknowledging. And then as, as part of this as a group, we're developing uh, lots and lots and lots of uh, different R packages for analyzing both the spatial information, but also single cell RNA sequencing data. And so doing anything single cell, uh, maybe check us out because we might have something that could help you along. Uh, and again, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone that contributed uh, to this work. Uh, this was a, a labor of love from many, many people. Uh, also Nils for a bunch of really stimulating conversations. Uh, and Wolfgang Huber and Susan Holmes for their Modern Statistics for Modern Biology uh, book, which really helped me when I was trying to get my head around a lot of this uh, spatial analysis. And I, I recommend uh, checking it out. Cool. Um, so thank you very much. I believe I've stuck to time, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, hi, Alice. Uh, this is uh, Leonardo. Um, great talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. As I saw you, like, um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I don't work. I don't work with this type of data, but I work with um, um, uh, data from the Vision platform and the Vision yeah. fluorescence. And uh, we are also struggling a lot with like uh, segmentation. And so I don't know how much of um, uh, uh, simple seg, I think that's the name, but um, yeah. how much of it can generalize to different types of um, morphologies or is it only mostly for like DAPI and identifying nuclei or like, um, or do you have plans on like expanding it and maybe making a complex segmentation <laughs> instead of simple? So, yeah. so 
I, I kind of doubt that it would transfer directly to Visium. It'd probably transfer to the, the I don't know what their their high dimensional technology that they've they've got uh, coming out like it's high dimensional spatial transcriptomics, but I'm sure there's like a fancier name for it by now. So it would probably apply to that. But in terms of Visium as it is, you could probably chuck it on. Um, but I don't know what what features you'd be trying to segment out and what you'd be using. Obviously, you're not at the cellular level with Visium. Um, so, but if you're just trying to segment out regions, maybe it could work. Um, but I think you're better off heading, instead of segmentation, heading down the kind of more cellular neighborhood kind of route where you just start clustering all the different spots and try to hope things pop out in that way. I, I'm sorry if that doesn't answer your question at all or fill you with hope, but yeah, I don't think it would apply at all to, to Visium data. We can try it. Uh, no, thank you. It does answer the question, and uh, but I do I do think that uh, um, there's also an opportunity to try to get information at the spot level where you have for a particular spot. You can say like here I have five cells, and they have these different shapes, and then this other spot I have I don't know two cells. Um, so that's where yeah, like yeah. like it could still be useful to so get that, that information. Yeah, with that SC features uh, package, we have had some success just, just success just analyzing things at the the kind of um, spatial level. And so we obviously don't go and use our um, really cell type specific spatial metrics, but we do look at spatial correlations and stuff. And we've been able to analyze things at that kind of spot resolution. But yeah, none of nothing. I, I don't have anything up my sleeve for kind of estimating number of cell types and, and those kinds of things in spots. Hi, uh, can you hear me? This is Lucas Weber. Um, hi, nice to meet you. How are you going? Hi. Uh, could you comment on the difference between simple seg and Steinbock from um, from Neil Selling this morning? So one of the differences is is that simple seg is in R, so you don't have to go off into to Python to 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 run the thing. Um, and so that was really our key motivation for for developing it. Um, it's it's also applicable to to different uh, imaging technologies. I'm not sure how uh, IMC specific Steinbrock is, but I would imagine that um, their kind of pipeline would probably end up having better performance in the sense that they, they either make use of deep cell or elastic, which are much more complicated uh, approaches, but they do require training. So if you're really, really worried about having perfect segmentation, I'd potentially go through that kind of pipeline where you can go through and really Try to optimize things uh, but the whole point of simple seg really is that it's just supposed to be simple and really allow you to do this quick kind of first pass analysis and potentially final pass analysis if you end up finding interesting signal so it, i guess a lot of it depends on your expertise and your, your willingness to to really do things i guess properly or optimally might be the, the type of word okay that's great thanks Um, hi, yeah, great talk. Uh, I have a question. So I, um, yeah, I found out the Spicy R and the Lisa cluster um, packages would use that stat to perform the spatial point process analysis. Um, uh, so for uh, these kind of data, you you have to have like an observation window just to construct the PPP um, the yeah. uh, ob. Uh, object in order to run the coding stat stat. So I just wonder like what kind, so what do you use as the observation window? Because that might, um, I also wonder like how much it affects the results. Like uh, do you use like a tissue boundary annotated um, or or like just the whole? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, this is, a, this is a really important uh, problem. And I've got a student that's got these really, really beautiful slides that show that your, your conclusions that you make with spatial analysis can change very much depending on the, um, the the window that you use. Obviously, if you kind of zoom into a, a region, cells might look like they're kind of randomly distributed. If you zoom out a little bit more, you might find that there's two populations really 
and they're very much avoiding. And then if you zoom out even further, the two populations that look like they were avoiding relative to the whole window space actually start to look like they're attracting. And so really nailing the, the window that you use is really important. Uh, in SPICE ER, we've got a few different ways of calculating windows. Obviously, you can mask out the, the, the tissue thing, which works really, really well if you've kind of got these uh, punched samples you might be using in a tissue microarray. Uh, but we also have methods for estimating either a convex hull or a concave hull around the cells, and we find that performs quite well. But obviously, you could also just use a square. Um, and if you use the square, if you use this sigma function that calculates for like, that kind of corrects a little bit for these global um, correlation structures. Uh, it kind of does an okay job of correcting for horrible window estimation. But yeah, no, that's a really important important point and important thing. And so in SPICER, we do have these simple ways of at least estimating these hulls, which can help a little. Yeah, so in general, like uh, which way do you like recommend? I recommend uh, using a convex hull and then using this sigma thing to account for a little bit of the structure so because often there's like little holes in the tissue and that that can help a little bit um, but i was also thinking that i, I probably should be implementing uh, something uh, a little bit more complex where maybe we go through and we dilate out from each cells and kind of like imprint or cookie cut what we think might be the tissue region as well and that should be a reasonable approach too but yeah i, I recommend at least using the convex hull and this sigma to account, account to account for any other weird stuff that's happening in the tissue. Um, all right, thank you. And I'm obviously, if you've been having difficulties with it, I'm obviously more than happy to chat at any time. It's, it's great if you've been applying it. Well, let's thank Alice again for a very nice talk. Um, um, I hope you feel better soon. Yeah, no, I'm feeling pretty good. It's just trying to breathe. Is the, yeah. the, 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 the not enjoyable thing, right? Well, thank you and enjoy the rest uh, of the Thank conference. you for the opportunity to present virtually as well. Like that obviously made things very convenient for me.